And then this, contusions are the next, and these are probably what you'll see if, if a patient is actually admitted to the hospital, this is probably what you see the most. In trauma, in what, what actually happens the most is the traumatic subarachnoid. But in somebody that's actually admitted to the hospital, this is probably what you would see the most. Um, so this is essentially a bruise on the brain. And it looks a little different than, say, a bleed. If somebody comes in with a hypertensive bleed, the bleed is more circular and it's, you know, it's, it's in a specific space. This, ha this is more, uh, this is, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? The, this is not as symmetric as those, and it can happen kind of anywhere. A lot of, the, a lot of it will happen of, of this coup and counter coup injuries where a patient will fall and hit the back of their head. And a lot of times they'll just have like a bump or something on the back of their head, but they'll have frontal lobe injury. They'll have the contusion on the front part of the brain. And that's because as they, as they hit, the brain hit, as the body hits, and the skull hits here, the brain actually comes up and hits the front of the skull. And the front of the skull base is, is really rigid, and it has a lot of, a lot of edges to it, so it's, can, it's really damaging. So that's actually a really common place to see those contusions, is at the bottom of the frontal lobe. And the problem with that is that that's where all of your personality is and so that's what makes a lot of these TBIs really impulsive and really um, agitated. So that's just another picture. I think that's the same picture actually. Um, and this is just a post-mortem picture and as you can see that these, this is that coagulated blood clots that are on there. And then this is another one with, the, this is the, the temporal lobes. The temporal lobes and the frontal lobe right through there are the ones that are affected a lot because of how the skull base is and because of how it, of how it hits. A traumatic intracranial hemorrhage is usually Usually somebody that comes in that you're, it almost looks like they have a bleed from from another cause, they have a they have a you know hypertensive bleed because it looks more classically like that. It, I'll show the picture first. It looks more like that. Maybe and so maybe you'll never know what came first. Did they you know did they bleed and then wreck their car, or they did they bleed and then fall, or did they you know fall and get a small tear in that area, and because they were on anticoagulants or whatnot, then that area grew. So. It's pretty hard to tell the difference. These are usually associated with some type of antiplatelet or anticoagulant use, um, and typically usually in the older population. Now you can have a delayed traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, and these usually happen in patients that are, that are GCS or 8 or less. And the reason they happen and can get so big is because these are the patients that are intubated, their exam is poor at baseline, so there's not a dramatic change in what's happening. Um, if you have somebody that comes in that's a GCS of 14 and they bleed significantly, you're going to notice because their exam is going to change so rapidly. Um, it occurs in about 10% of the traumatic um, intracranial hemorrhages, and it can happen within the first couple days of being there. So um, they still need to be watched, and it's because of the coagulopathy. Um, it could be because that brain tissue is dead and just more apt to bleeding. But the mortality associated with it is extremely high. And then this is, this is a really drastic picture of it, but this is say what something would look like. The patient had this bleed, we did a follow-up CAT scan, their image was stable, their, blood, their, their exam is stable, so we think we're, in the, we think we're safe, but then a couple days later they have another big bleed on top of it. 